Okay, now, as you think about how to use the skills we've been developing as detectives, and I've given you a few of those, uh, it, some of the things that you take for granted, the simplest uh, approaches are the most valuable, right? I mean, for example, that first principle of, of being careful about your presuppositions. Seems like a simple principle. Well, I wanna give you another one today that is a, also kind of similarly simple. And that's that we have to be good listeners and we have to hang on every word. This is especially important if you're interviewing a, a bad guy, right, for a case, or you're interviewing a po possible suspect. Aspect. I want to listen to every word. As a matter of fact, I will often have my interviews transcribed afterwards, and I'll spend days and weeks going over the transcriptions because maybe I wasn't listening well enough at the time and I missed a certain expression, I missed a certain phrase, and every word matters to detectives. It can be irritating if you're a, a detective who's also a dad, because my kids used to hate that I would always listen to every single word they would offer, right? But this is an important skill set. As a matter of fact, detectives have kind of honed this into something called forensic statement analysis. What we would typically do is if a person is uh, suspected of doing a crime, we would give them a piece of paper and I would say, hey, yesterday was the day of the crime. I want you to write down everything you did from the time you got up in the morning until the time you went to bed. I'm going to give you one side of paper to do it on, usually about 24 lines. I'm going to give you an ink pen. So any change you make, I'll have to see. You'll have to scratch it out to start over again. Then I take this, print, this discipline called forensic statement analysis and I begin to examine the statement to see if there are any signs of deception any signs of intent. Uh, I'm looking for certain kinds of things. I'll give you an example of what I'm looking for. I'm often looking for the words that are optional. If you don't need to use a word, why would you use it? These are typically gonna be adverbs and adjectives. Those are options you have. Why would you add that adjective? Why would you describe it that way? It typically will tell me something about you, whether you're telling me the truth or what, how it is you feel about a particular thing. Also, uh, use of pronouns. What, what, do you, what kind of words do you use to describe the victim? What kind of words do you use to describe anybody else in the narrative? What kinds of proper names do you use or do you not use proper names? These are things I'm looking at very, do you compress time or do you expand time? Do you, do you skip over hours of activity with just a few words or do you spend a dozen words describing a second? I, this is gonna tell me something. I'm also looking for deception indicators, equivocations, places where you, maybe you're trying to say to minimize your involvement or to, to distract me. With, I'm looking at all these things. It's really more of a, a, an art than a science. But I was a new investigator to the scriptures and I thought, well, could I apply something like forensic statement analysis to determine? if the claims of the Gospels were true. I began, and then when we do forensic statement analysis, we actually use different colored pens. And we'll circle all the pronoun use. And we'll circle all the adverbs or adjectives. We'll circle or, or box in compression or expansion of time. We'll, we'll look at all these little details and we'll have different colors for each detail. I bought a Bible, I didn't own one, and I wish I'd have bought one that had bigger margins. The one I bought was had small little margins and I spent uh, probably a month looking at the Gospel of Mark. You know why? Because I had read that the Gospel of Mark was written in Rome. Papias, a bishop, uh, early bishop in the church uh, history of the church, uh, wrote and said that Mark's Gospel was written by Mark while he was listening to the teaching of Peter in Rome. Really? So Papias makes this claim that Mark's Gospel is actually a transcription of the preaching of Peter. Really? If that's the case, I should see something forensically in Mark's gospel that really would show me the fingerprints of Peter, or at least show me the influence of Peter, right? So I began to use forensic statement analysis on Mark to see if it could tell me anything about Peter. And I discovered some things that I thought were very interesting. I've got a diagram for you in your participant's guide. I started to see a number of, 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 of interesting, for example, the first disciple mentioned in Mark's gospel. Hmm, who's he that? It's Peter who's the last disciple mentioned in the gospel. That's Peter. This is a, a, a something called inclusio. It's this a bookmarking. This is typically offered when somebody is engaged or is, is writing the, the gospel themselves. They might bookmark it as the beginning and the end of the book has that particular character. And sure enough, Peter bookmarks the ends and beginning and the end of Mark's gospel. But more interesting things, and I've got a list of them in your participants guide, but the things that stand out for me just now talking to you about this are, are for example, if you read through Mark's gospel, you will see that he uses, Peter identifies him by name, especially given how short the gospel is, at a rate that's much higher than any other gospel writer. Not only that, he, he um, never typically adds the expression Simon Peter. 
For example, John always calls Peter Simon Peter because there's so many Peters, he's trying to distinguish one from, so many Simons rather, he's trying to distinguish one from the other. But, but it's clear that Mark is talking about somebody, he's familiar with somebody who's very familiar to the reader. He never uses that qualifier on his name. Even more interesting, every time that Simon is described in Mark's gospel, when Peter does something embarrassing, Mark minimizes it. Mark covers for him. So if there's an embarrassing episode, I'll give you an example of this. You know when Jesus walked on water and he walked to the uh, boat with the disciples in it? Remember that episode? Well, you know what happened, right? Peter says, hey, Jesus, can I come out of the boat too? If that's really you, can I come out of the boat? It's almost like he's asking for a demonstration here. He wants to know if it, he gets out of the boat, right? And he takes a few steps toward Jesus and he begins to sink. Pretty embarrassing. And Jesus in front of the other disciples says, Peter, you have little faith. I mean, you didn't have enough faith to even walk on this water with me. It's kind of an embarrassing episode for Peter. Well, it's recorded twice. Matthew records it and Mark records it. Only in Mark's version, Peter never gets out of the boat. He leaves out that detail, that embarrassing detail. There are a couple more like this where he's more embarrassing. Peter's more embarrassing in almost every gospel except for Mark. As a matter of fact, there are times when Mark will say the disciples said something embarrassing when in fact the other gospel authors will identify that it was Peter of the disciples who actually said it. Well, Mark's not gonna put that in. Mark always gives you the least embarrassing view of Peter. There are lots of good reasons. I've got a diagram that shows you making the case circumstantially, as we already talked about in the last session, for why I think Peter's fingerprints are all over Mark's gospel. It just helped me to take a little step to verify, to tend to kind of corroborate the claims of the gospels. But now I wanna to come to a, a point that I think is critical for us because a lot of uh, educated skeptics People like Bart Ehrman, a very well-educated biblical scholar who's written a number of books, I've mentioned him in my book, Cold Case Christianity, making claims that he cannot, he could not trust the Gospels given on the differences he sees in the most ancient manuscripts. Here's what I mean. You realize, of course, we don't have an original copy of any New Testament book. That's not a big deal, but it was to Bart. He didn't know, he had never heard that before he entered Moody Bible Institute. There he discovered that we did not have an original copy of any gospel. And in fact, the most ancient versions, the most ancient manuscripts we have, when compared to one another, there are variations between the manuscripts. As a matter of fact, he makes a famous claim that there are more variations between the ancient manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. And that sounds pretty powerful. And for a lot of people, that could be a stumbling block, right? You mean to tell me we don't have an original and then the copies we do have are, are, are did it have some differences between those copies? As a matter of fact, you'll see in your Bible, if you hold a Bible like an ESV or a, uh, uh, an NASB, those translations have footnotes that identify the differences between the ancient copies. So how can you be sure that we have returned reliably to the inerrant original if what we're doing is recrafting a manuscript from ancient copies that have slight variations? Well, it never bothered me as an investigator, uh, as an atheist looking at this issue because I've entered into crime scenes for now over 25 years. When we set a crime scene, we typically use tape like this in order to mark the edges of the crime scene. You know, we'll tie it to a post. How big do you think we mark it? We don't just start, if a crime occurred right here, I wouldn't just start at the edges of these chairs. I'd probably start at the corners of the block I want everything for maybe half a mile out to determine, well, how did he get here? I'm gonna rope in far more than I need. And that means that inside that crime scene, there's gonna be two kinds of things. There's gonna be stuff that actually is related to the case, is evidence related to the actual act. That's gonna get a placard like this. I'm gonna put that placard down to the evidence, but there's also gonna be stuff in the scene that's not evidence. It was either there before the crime Maybe if someone was killed in this scene, uh, paramedics came in and they tried to rescue this person and now they've got their paramedic paraphernalia all over the scene. That's not evidence related to the crime. Those are artifacts that either are there before the crime occurs or are left in the scene by say the paramedics who now have their packaging all over the place and half these blood smears are from the paramedics. There are as always evidence and artifacts in crime scenes. Evidence and artifacts. My job is to remove the artifacts so I can get back to the evidence to recreate the scene in its most pristine form. That's a skill set we use. We know how to separate artifacts from crime scenes. Well, we have a text. 
and you think there might be some variations, some artifacts in the text, no problem. The same approach we spend in crime scenes, the same approach we take in crime scenes, we can take in the biblical text to remove the artifacts to get back to the pristine, inerrant original. And how we do it is by comparing the manuscripts we have. We ask the same questions in crime scenes. Okay, well, first of all, uh, is there, is there, uh, is there, can I identify a late entry? Look, if I see a paramedic uh, smear there and I know the paramedics came in after the crime, I can identify that as a late entry. I can then remove it. It was not there at the time of the crime. It came in late. Okay, take it out. Um, is there something that's just different by its very nature? When you see all the wrapping materials that don't look like they belong in the scene because they came in from the paramedic's truck, you can pretty easily remove them. They're different in terms of character. There are a number of things I've written in your participant's guide that you can take a look at, and these are the things that we look for, the nature of the artifacts that identifies them as artifacts, and then we remove them. Could you imagine if I could take a photograph of the crime scene just seconds before the crime, and then as the crime's occurring, and then a seconds after it occurred, and I could take 10 photographs, I would be able to compare the photographs to see what comes in late, to see what doesn't belong, to get back to the original. Same thing has happened in our manuscript evidence. We have so many manuscripts that we can compare, that we can look and see where there's a variation, because it may not be in the same place in the second manuscript. So we can kind of get a sense of this. I've given you an example in your participant's guide of a dispatch call to a robbery at a 7-Eleven. Take a look at it right now. You'll see I've given you five or six versions of this call, and in each call, there's a slight variation in the way the dispatcher sends it out to the computer terminal in the radio car, in the actual police car. Yet, I don't think that those officers are gonna have any problem getting to the right location for the right kind of crime with the right kind of suspect description, even though there is a variation in every single dispatch line. Well, why? Because they can actually compare all the dispatch lines and return reliably to the original intent of the dispatcher. The same thing happens in our manuscript evidence. Although there may be some variations, we can compare documents to get back to a, uh, an original reliably. Now you've got two tools to put in your bag for this session. The first is hang on every word. Look at every word seriously. Consider the optional words. Consider the compression and expansion of time, even as you're reading through the Gospels. And take a look at my case for Peter's involvement in the Gospel of Mark. Secondly, Learn how to separate artifacts from evidence, and don't be shaken by the fact you may have artifacts in your crime scene. Can you imagine if we got called to a crime scene and we said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. There's junk in the crime scene. No, we have a responsibility to remove the artifacts to get back to the evidence. So do you. You've now got two more tools that'll help you determine the truth from the Gospels.